Please begin the platform edge. That's all set? Very good. Uh, one second. Let me check. I know about that. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming up to uh, District 3. I'd like to thank uh, Captain Perez, who's the CEO of District 3, for hosting us here today. Uh, actually, for me, this is where it all started. A long, long time ago, 35 and a half years ago, my uh, first train was all the way downstairs. Remember, District 3 wasn't as nice as it is now. It was a little bit smaller. I remember being turned out by my sergeant and going down to the uh, downtown A plat, and that's where it all started for me. So up front, I'd like to extend the NYPD sympathies and support to a couple of police departments that are dealing with tragic losses today. First, a 17-year veteran of the Milwaukee Police Department was shot and killed yesterday afternoon by a suspect wanted on gun and drug offenses. And second, a person who was fighting with police along a roadway just outside Phoenix, Arizona last night shot two state troopers, killing one of them. I'm told that the trooper who was murdered just graduated from their police academy in May. Every member of the NYPD sends its heartfelt condolences to the family, friends, and fellow officers of these two dedicated cops. We're all mourning this completely unnecessary loss of life. These incidents underscore the unpredictability of the law enforcement profession. I want to thank all the men and women in uniform here today for making the decision to take these jobs, for making a difference, and they do each and every day in the lives of New Yorkers. As we expand our neighborhood policing program, Deeper into our transit bureau today, we now have half of our 12 transit districts up and running with neighborhood coordination officers. Overall crime and arrest are down in our subway system, which sees nearly 6 million riders each day. This is a much different city than it was when I started back in January 1983. Back then, petty and violent crime was rampant, and riding the train as a rookie transit cop and for passengers too, quite frankly, was dangerous. We worked by ourselves back then, from 8 at night to 4 in the morning. I rode the A train and D train, three round trips a night. It was a rule for us as cops that we could only stay in a car for three stops. I think I've told you all before, this has really uh, made it, validated my decision to become a cop. I saw way back then that uh, people riding those trains and late at night. train is now arriving on the lower level. Please stand away from the platform edge. It's the only thing about having a press conference in the subway station. You have to take a time out for the uh, PA announcements. But I even knew back then that it was important, uh, the work that we did. You saw the sense of relief as uh, you came into each and every train car. So just like our neighborhoods above ground, the same people use the same subway stations every day. And they come from all walks of life. We view every person who passes through the turnstiles as people who can assist us in our primary mission of fighting crime and keeping people safe. Some people, and even some cops, don't necessarily enjoy talking to strangers. But I'll tell you, when you're a uniformed cop, you're not dealing with strangers because everybody already knows who you are. This is the busiest subway system in the United States. And we expect to have all of our transit districts operating under neighborhood policing by early next year. And to do that, we have to increase our uniform presence down here to support the effort. So we will increase by 15% the number of police officers on patrol in each district. The expansion we're announcing today will help us continue to reduce crime past already record lows by building trust and strengthening relationships with as many of the regular riders of this vast subway system as possible. We can proactively address many of the individual issues that are specific to these areas. And by addressing those concerns, by being out there, visible, we can work at preventing crime and disorder from occurring in the first place. This is our way forward as a police department and as a city. It's about sharing the responsibility for our public safety and taking steps together to make this a better and safer New York City for everybody. I'd like to introduce Chief Delatore now. He's our uh, Transit Bureau Chief. Eddie? Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge from the MTA with Show Glazier. Chief Station Manager, and Ken Davis. Davis. Sorry, Kenny. <laughs> and Ken Davis, who's also a Chief Station Manager. Um, and I want to thank the MTA and the Transit for the great partnership uh, that they've extended to us since I've been on board here. They've, the uh, President Byford and the Transit, New York City Transit, have been tremendous. Anything we need, they've been here for us. And the, even in the program that we put together here today, 
uh, you'll see that when you look at the signage, <coughs> You'll see that when you look at the signage, it's not the NYPD alone. It's a collaborative effort. Uh, we have the two NCOs that are assigned to each station, along with the station manager that's responsible for that station. So it's, uh, <clears throat> it goes to what the police commission, the chief department have said all along. It's a shared responsibility, and we're really happy that the, that the transit authority or transit, New York City Transit, is sharing that responsibility with us along with our ridership. I'm going to go quickly into the four districts that we're expanding into right now. Uh, we're going into District 3, which is where we are now, and the communities that it services are the Upper West Side, Morningside Heights, Hamilton Heights, Washington Heights, Inwood, Marble Hill, Manhattan Valley, Manhattanville, Sugar Hill, Central Harlem North, and Central Harlem South. That's District 3 in Manhattan. We're also going into District 4, Manhattan. Uh, District 4 is the lower end of Manhattan, services the East Village, NoHo, SoHo, Murray Hill, Midtown East, Gramercy Park, East Harlem, the Upper East Side, and the Lower East Side. In addition to the two districts we're expanding uh, into in Manhattan, we're also expanding into District 20 out in Queens. Now, District 20 is quite a large district. It covers Woodhaven, Richmond Hill, Jamaica, Briarwood, Kew Gardens, Forest Hills, Jackson Heights, Long Island City. The next Uptown Express train is now arriving on the upper level. Please stand away from the platform edge. Mm. Queensbridge, Roosevelt Island, Rego Park, Elmhurst, Woodside, Astoria, and Flushing. And the last district we're expanding into today is out in Brooklyn. It's District 32. It covers East Flatbush, Park Slope, Crown Heights, Prospect Park, East New York, Brownsville, and Red Hook. Um, you know, we have found that the, uh, the two districts that we started the pilot in back in April, District 30 and District 12, we've had a lot of success there. The feedback has been tremendous. Uh, not only from transit employees, but from riders themselves. Uh, we've made a lot of connections there between the police officers who patrol the same stations and lines every day and the ridership. Uh, even here where we've done a soft rollout this week, we already have some really positive feedback where officers have gone out and uh, you know, took that forward step since they had the ownership in, this, in the area they were assigned and saw a crime complaint come in took the complaint, went out and viewed video, and went right out and made the arrest on somebody who committed a grand larceny. In another case where we feed our officers information through the MTA portal, they picked up a complaint from a passenger who said that somebody had knocked the phone out of her hand, and they actually made an appointment to go visit that passenger at a place of work and uh, took a complaint from her. And I believe she was very happy to see that we noticed the complaint and responded to it. Uh, with that, if you have any questions, Yes. Districts are we going to? Is 32 the top <clears throat> Yeah, the, the numbers aren't in order. There are 12 districts in the Transit Bureau. So right now, we're going to have, out of the 12, we're going to have six districts that actually have the neighborhood policing model in place. But that's in place right now, today? Or? It's in place right now. If you search the platforms, you should find pictures of our NCOs that are assigned there as well as the station managers that are in the photos with them, with an email address to reach out to the NCOs. Now, we took into consideration a lot of things. We took into consideration um, the ability to get it done with the amount of personnel we had, with the ridership, uh, with the needs of the district, and the connectivity within the district as well, because one of the key points is that when the officers get on a line, they may be responsible for multiple lines, but they have to connect so the officer does not leave the station to go to another part of the, part of the system. So they, those were the six that we picked first. Uh, we, we intend to and will roll out the rest of the, di the districts in early 2019.
Michelle, would you like to? Yeah. Um, I think in regards to uh, the MTA or New York City Transit standpoint. Closer to the mic. Oh, yes. Uh, we, we want to be able to work cohesively with the NYPD and our stations to help the community and our employees feel safer by addressing concerns as they come in. So, like specifically on a day-to-day -day basis? What? Absolutely. So if we get a tweet from somebody and it, and it regard, you know, it's in regards to something that uh, would be a legal matter or something that we would need the NYPD's help, we want to build that close, cohesive working relationship. Ashley. Yeah. So some of them are coming from inside of the actual district itself. We're reassigning offices that had different assignments previously. And then some of them are actually coming from other districts and new offices that were assigned to the Transit Bureau. We recently had over 100 new offices assigned to the Transit Bureau that are in training right now. So. No, not precincts. So some of them came early on from other districts, and, and a lot of them have had their assignments changed under this model from other jobs that they did previously within it. They're now coming out and back in uniform on the trains. In addition to that, we've had new hires, and we received over 100 new offices in the Transit Bureau. Not, not, there won't be offices in each of the stations in each, but they will be in each district and they will be in their sectors. So I'm going to, if you like, I'll explain the coverage. There are two NCOs assigned to each sector in each district. Out of our districts right now, except for the district in Queens, they all have three sectors. So there are two NCOs assigned to each sector and then there are steady sector offices on each platoon. So a platoon is a shift. So every shift has steady sector offices, and on every shift we have three different squads so they can have days off. So at any time, two squads overlap. So basically what we have is six steady offices assigned to a geographical area that's much smaller than the district is with the uh, two NCOs that are also assigned. And they cover those sectors, by the way, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there's a communication in place, and the officers will always know what's going on. That's why I go back to the story about the grand larceny arrest. As soon as that arrest came in, those officers are notified. Not the arrest, the complaint came in. The officers were notified. They sought out the video. They found pictures of the person, and they, they went out and made an arrest. Okay. Okay, so it's not, it's not social interaction from my perspective. It is crime and it is quality of life. When I have offices assigned to certain stations, they are responsible for, every, for everything that goes on there. They're responsible for the quality of life conditions. They're responsible for the turnstile jumpers. We had a case where um, a transit worker told us that at about 7 in the morning, if you come here, you will see 20 or 30 people go right through the turnstile every, every morning. So the NCOs went back the next morning, they dressed down, they waited, and sure enough, 20 people walked through the gate. They captured or, or uh, I would say, uh, held on to the 20 people. They explained to them that there was a new sheriff in town, they weren't going to tolerate this anymore, and next time you come through the turnstile, you better pay. They gave them all a break that day, but they were setting the tone for that station. And the MTA worker who gave us the information was very happy to see that somebody was acting on it. All six, all six, we average about a 15% increase in patrol presence. Okay. Yeah. Not, not right now. We saw. Um, we saw an increase in grand lost knees, and it had more to do with sleeping passengers and a few picks 
But again, we increased personnel on our lines, uh, met with all the borough commanders to discuss it. We don't wait till the end of the week here to see where the crime's gonna land. As we watch any sort of pattern grow day by day, we move on it. Total uniform, I don't have that, but I can get it to you. Thanks, guys. You want to give it to me off topic, please? Okay. Right. Thank you. Oh, that's PC. Everybody's ready? Ashley? Hi, Chris Daniel. This question is for Chief Shea, I think. Um, there was a, when you identified the suspects in the story, Precinct Homicide, there was a dark skinned gentleman wearing a hat with the letter A on it. Um, he was identified as a suspect. Um, as far as we know, he is not one of the 12 who was arrested. Um, but you all say you have all of the suspects so far. So I wonder if you can clarify what happened with that individual. Yep. So, so what I'll say with that is, and, and again, I want to uh, give thanks to Darcel Clark in the Bronx. As you know, last week we announced the 12 indictments. That investigation is still going on. Uh, what we said last week was when you look at that video, we, we have identified everyone uh, of interest to us that is in those videos. That's not to say that the entire investigation is closed at this time. Um, we, we feel that we have the majority of the individuals that were involved in that particular incident but we will go forward and there still is more work to be done. I will not comment on an individual person on a photo. So, so you're, you're saying that you don't know, that you don't have everyone? Because the, the line that we... Every, everyone, that was, everyone that was released to the media and pictures to the media, we know exactly who they are. Yeah. Right here. Hey, you're in the subway, so you got to speak a little louder. Yeah. Um, I saw this morning that you arrested those who were known to have been detained after a year and a half after the murder of her son. I was wondering why it took so long. Yeah. So, complicated case uh, from January of 17, I believe, a tragic incident involving a, a five year old that was left home. Uh, the five year old eventually su succumbed to acute intoxication from drugs. That was back in January of 2017. The investigation did take some time. Uh, it was eventually ruled, I believe, a homicide by the ME's office last December, uh, December of 17. Uh, since that time, we've been actively looking for her. She's a resident of Staten Island. About two weeks ago, we located her, apprehended her in Alabama, and she's back in New York City as yesterday to face charges for manslaughter. That's unknown, Rocco. We do, we do, and that's a very interesting case. So, so when you look at this particular case, I'm just going to highlight a couple things here and the how, how instrumental Crime Stoppers is going to be going forward tied to this case and our, our Special Victims Division. But, but Two weeks ago, we had a case in the 105 precinct involving a nurse that was found murdered, uh, reported to us by her brother who found uh, the nurse under tragic circumstances. As that investigation went forward, it, it came together with a separate uninvolved, uh, unrelated investigation from the 78th precinct in Brooklyn from several weeks earlier involving a rape case. Two independent investigations that, as they progressed, led our detectives to one and the same individual. That individual was tracked across the country. He was apprehended this week in California. I'll point out that when our uh, detectives with our partners uh, from regional fugitive, regional fugitive apprehension apprehended her, there was a separate woman in a hotel room in California that was being held against her will. So it really highlights, I mean, a couple incidents of late where we had detectives rescue somebody trying to commit suicide in Manhattan. Here you have detectives flying across the country and potentially saving a life uh, at, at a door room of a hotel. 
I can get back to you. When you look at that individual, uh, now coming back to New York, he's not coming back yet, but he will be coming back, and DCPI can provide pedigree information for you. We are asking for any and all victims, the common denominator in these two cases, one being a murder, one being a rape, is dating websites. Uh, so this individual is known to us, and it is believed by us that this individual uses dating websites to meet women and then victimize these women. We're going to ask anyone with any information, if you have any information, whether as a victim or you've heard anything, to call our Special Victims Hotline if you're the victim of a rape. And on our right, we have the Crime Stoppers. All right. Crime Stop is 577 tips. We, we are uh, actively encouraging any victims or anyone with information on this case because there's potentially more victims out there. Chief, what's your, what's your Excuse me? What's your we saw multiple websites. Chief, was it tip from the crime stoppers? Stop, 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 stop. No, this was good old fashioned police work and some really good detective work involved in both of these okay. cases. Well, what I'm asking the public now to do, though, is any information whatsoever. Funnel it to our Crime Stoppers okay. desk. We have very trained detectives. Uh, that will make sure that that information is followed up on and we uh, get justice for all victims out there. Deputy Commissioner Richardson will take care. Good afternoon. Uh, the disciplinary case against Daniel Pantaleo is being prosecuted by the Civilian Complaint Review Board. They're an independent agency from the police department that is empowered to prosecute cases in the NYPD disciplinary system. So we have provided to the CCRB the entire NYPD case file and all the materials related to that. We're actively communicating with them to offer them any resources and assistance they need. Uh, their case is under evaluation. They've had an independent investigation going for some time, and they're going to process all the information and move the case forward as they see appropriate. Do they seek a recommendation from the They're independent, so they'll make a recommendation to the department as to what they think the disciplinary outcome should be. You would have to consult with the CCRB to see where they are in their process. Uh, the actions of every single officer that was on scene were evaluated, and from that evaluation it was determined that one sergeant on scene did not take some steps that she should have taken. That sergeant is facing disciplinary charges that the police department is handling, and the other officer who had, who had identified misconduct was police officer Daniel Pantaleo, and the CCRB is prosecuting him. Sergeant Adonis. Sergeant Casey Adonis. Uh, there were other officers on scene, including a plainclothes sergeant, but again, a thorough evaluation of all of the actions of the officers on scene indicated that there was only misconduct attributable to two of the officers. Sergeant Adonis is facing disciplinary charges, and again, that will be the subject of a public disciplinary hearing if it's to go to trial, and at that time the facts of the case will be known. The sergeant who you're referring to did arrive on the scene after the incident occurred. The plainclothes sergeant. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. So, yeah. We recently had the speed cameras around the city school, so it's turned off. Um, I asked the MCS Yeah, just just in general, I'm I'm uh, personally and professionally disappointed uh, by the inaction uh, up in Albany. You're putting real lives at risk. Uh, Chief Channel will talk about the specific measures that uh, the NYPD will be taking in in, ap in the absence of uh, speed cameras, operable speed cameras. Part of the Vision Zero program is that we have in each and every precinct a traffic safety program. In that particular program, we have officers who are focusing on doing enforcement. We've asked our officers after we review the material and the locations of the cameras 
for priority locations, collisions, injuries. Our officers will be doing enforcement, speed enforcement, but also hazardous violation enforcement that could very well be right away, red lights, disobey signs, um, uh, improper turns, cell phone texting. Those are other violations also that could be problematic for our public and our children. So we are going to do that. Um, in terms of Vision Zero initiatives, um, as we speak today, we have an initiative, a speed enforcement initiative that we started yesterday. We'll continue till the end of the week. And what happened is that um, uh, we've utilized that during the course of Vision Zero to target those violations. So we do have additional person uh, this week going out there looking at speed violations. And certainly our recommendation is that they don't commit violations and they won't receive summonses, which includes fines and also possibility of points on your license. The other portion that we're also reaching out with our partners, Department of Transportation and Department of Education, is that education is very important, that we speak to our students, our parents, our teachers, and uh, currently our NCO officers and also our precinct-based personnel, sector people, uh, school safety division, school safety task force officers visit schools. We've asked them to reinforce the message to our students. Simple tip, four areas. Use the crosswalk when they are available. That's where the motorists expect to see you. Look both ways. Don't assume that the motorists see you, even though you have the light. We ask them to avoid mid-block crossing. Again, exercise caution. And ultimately, don't be distracted. Put away the cell phone. Don't text and don't speak on the phone as you're crossing. Um, we anticipate that our officers will be out there, focusing our enforcement out there. But again, uh, for an example, if it's a very rainy day, as opposed to a speed camera, the officers need to set up. They have to utilize the equipment, and it, it's labor intensive. It certainly um, it requires more work as opposed to a speed camera that captures the information and sends it electronically over to the Department of Transportation. And outside of that with you, I think before the cameras were turned off, or not, they're not turned off, but you know what I mean, um, where you said the cameras help the officers focus on other things that certainly are not speed enforcement. Now that they have to focus more on speed enforcement, does that make the city less safe? It's, sure. So the NYPD officers are capable of many things. We have 36,000 cops. If we have to put more resources towards uh, uh, doing speed enforcement, we'll do that. And that won't be at the risk of, of the city. It does not make the city less safe. John. The child was prescribed the medication. Uh, I won't comment on any potential motive. Uh, again, this case appears to be a case where uh, the child suffered from epilepsy, was, was legally prescribed medication, uh, but then it, it morphed into a case where there was a neglect of care and uh, an overindulgence, if you will, of medication prescribed when the child was left uh, outside the care of the parent. Sure. So I'm just going to give, run you through a little chronology. Uh, the subject was wanted for an active parole warrant for a criminal possession of a firearm and reckless endangerment. He fled on foot. He entered an apartment, exited a separate window to the street level where he was apprehended. The suspect was transported to St. Luke's Hospital for medical observation and attention. It was determined that he had no injuries and that he was released from the hospital that same day. During his apprehension, two police officers were injured. Hold on, I can't, I can't hear you, Ashley. Uh, no, that determination hasn't been made yet. Rocco, anybody, hold on, anybody on this side? You're talking about the 105 homicide? It, it appears that it's an...